keep like stopping with the oyster. It's very stubborn. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started because um, we're looking at two chapters again tonight, Mark chapter 4 and 5. Our approach to it's going to be a little bit different um, once we finish the reading, but I'll, I'll get into that in just a moment. So, uh, But we're going to start the reading like we have been doing. I'll start, and then just a verse will go around and as, as many times as we need to. So, uh, And if anyone hasn't gotten the handout over on the table, that's where the reading is. Again, he began to teach beside the sea. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the sea and sat there while the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. He began to teach them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, a sower... Okay. You can finish that. A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly, since it had no depth of soil. And Nancy, we're on verse 6. Yeah, and number 6. And when the seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seed fell into good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing, and yielding thirty, and sixty, and a hundredfold. And he said, Let anyone with ears to, listen, to hear listen. When he was alone, those who were around him, along with the twelve, asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything comes in parables. In order that they may indeed look, but not perceive, and may indeed listen, but not understand, so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? And how will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones on the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. When they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy. But they have no root and endure only for a while. Then, when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. Oh, hi. Yes. <laughs> Others are those sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word. But <clears throat> the cares of the world and the war of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, and it yields nothing. And these are the ones sown on the good soil. <clears throat> they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. 21. He said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under the bushel basket or under the bed and not on the lampstand? For there is nothing hidden except to be disclosed, nor is anything secret except to come to light. Let anyone with ears to hear listen. And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. The message you give will be the me the measure you give will be the measure you get, and still more will be given you. For to those who have more will be given, and from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. He also said, "The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground, and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow." And he does not know how. The earth produces itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can, be, with what can we <clears throat> compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which 
when sown upon the ground was the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yet when it is so sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep, on a cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. All right, so the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at each of these chapters and asking the who, what, when, where, why, how. We're not going to do that with this one because this first chapter especially is different. Uh, this just starts off with Jesus' teaching. So we have seen chapters 1 through 3. We, I think we talked about this last week. We see Jesus as a healer. There's a lot of that going on. He's going all around healing people, casting out demons. And there's a shift here in the fourth chapter where he goes from healings to teaching. And this is the first time we really get some extensive teachings from him in Mark's gospel. Um, just so we can do the, the where, still somewhere right around there, Capernaum, right around the coast of the Sea of Galilee. So he hasn't moved from Mark chapter 3. Um, but we look at this first section, and that's kind of how I want to go down and look at this, is just section by section. Um, I broke it up a little differently than it might be in the Bible. I tried to you know, keep things grouped together. Uh, but this first section, the first nine verses, we get the parable of the sower. And so I want to ask you right away, who is the sower in this story? Jesus. Jesus. Any other thoughts? I heard God. Any others? It doesn't really say. Right, it doesn't. I've seen some interpretations that say us. Yeah. You know, that, that he's talking to his disciples and saying, okay, you're going to go out and sow. That's the point, is he doesn't really say. And you can interpret it multiple ways. And this is the thing with parables. A parable is not just a story told to make one specific point, like a, a metaphor, and, and it's driving at one certain thing. A parable has multiple ways of understanding it and interpreting it. The point of a parable is just to get you to think more about it. Oh, it could be this, or, or it could also be this. It's just... It's drawing you in so that you can dig into it and just think about all aspects of it. So Jesus is not just coming to his disciples and saying, hey, you need to be good soil so that you can receive God's word and bear good fruit. That's to the point, right? Instead, he tells this story um, that leads them to come to him and say, what are you talking about? So whenever you don't understand a parable, if there's ever something in Scripture you don't understand, know that you're not alone. The disciples came to Jesus, too, and said, we have no idea what you're talking about. And here, Jesus says, yeah, that's kind of the point. Um, I, want, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself there. That's in the next section. But uh, coming back into this first part, we get the sower going out and... We find out later that the seed is the word of God. And so this sower is just casting out, indiscriminate, just putting it everywhere uh, as someone planting wood. I, I read something that said back then the, 
they, they scatter the seed and then went and plowed it under. So this is how they would do it. They'd just go cast it out and then come later and, and plow it under. Um, so how does that connect with the word of God now? The seed being thrown all over. Just going and sharing the message wherever. And, and that's okay. what Jesus has been doing okay. all up so, until now. Just okay. Not one specific place like the synagogue. It's just going all over all these different places, all these different people, and sharing the word of God, the message he came to proclaim. So the first one, he says, some falls on a path, and birds come and eat it right up. Others fall on rocky ground, not much soil. It, it can grow a little bit, but not a whole lot because there's not much depth to, to build roots. Uh, and then the sun comes out and just scorches it and and it dies. Other seed goes into the thorns. The thorns choke it out. It can't grow anything. Other seeds fall onto good soil and brings forth grain 30 and 60 and 100 fold. Does that mean anything to you, 30 and 60 and 100 fold? No. I, does it mean anything to anyone? <laughs> OK, benefit of being a pastor for eight years in Nebraska. It meant something to them because it was a rural farm community. So I actually learned a lot about some of these parables out there. Um, crops are not going to yield 30 and 60 and 100 fold. If you're lucky, you might get 10. Uh, so this is supposed to be an outrageous, extravagant number. You know, people are supposed to hear it and be like, wow, that's impossible or that's huge. Um, but it's not something that would necessarily make a whole lot of sense. Um, but saying that the word of God sown in good soil produces way more than you think possible. Um, anything, looking at this parable as a whole, so this whole first part of the, the page, anything surprise you here about what Jesus is saying or doing? Was there anything that jumped out at you? He, he seems to negate the very people that he's talking to. Say more about that. Because he's calling them rocky soil rather than being receptive. And yet he knows full well that they're not understanding what he's saying. He says so. He's kind of tough on the crowd. Yes. This chapter, he is very tough on the crowd. And we're going to come to some more of that in just a little bit that you're kind of like, whoa. Like, what does this tell me about Jesus? Looking in this first section of the parable, which one are you? What kind of soil are you? Because I don't know about you, but I can look at this, and I can see myself in each one of these. Sometimes I'm good soil, and I'm receptive to this. Uh, other times, you know, I, I can receive God's word, and I'm really excited about it, but then something pops up, and it's just gone. And, and the thing that I read that morning is thrown out the window because I'm flustered or frustrated or stressed. Other times the cares and concerns of the world, which he, he talks about later when he explains it. Uh, the cares and concerns of the world come in and are just too much. I mean, I, I can see myself in each one of these. And I think that's kind of the, one of the points of this, is that we can identify with multiple aspects of a parable. And it's easy to say, oh, I, I'm the good soil, or I want to be the good soil, but I think if we look at the other ways and say, how am I the rocky soil? How am I the thorny soil? Um, it can help us to move away from that. You know, awareness can help bring about change. Um, but getting back to what you were saying about him being tough on the crowd, we get to the second section. So the disciples come to him um, and ask him about the parables. And he says, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. So to you, I'm, you all are getting this secret. But those on the outside, everything comes in parables. In order that they may indeed look but not perceive, 
listen but not understand, so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. That's not something you'd expect Jesus to say. I'm doing this so that they will not turn and be forgiven. So this is a quote from Isaiah, I believe. Um, That's why it's got the little uh, quotation marks starting with they and ending with forgiven. Um, But it, it sure seems here like Jesus would want to get the message out. We want more and more people to hear this and to to come into it and claim it and live it. Uh, But it seems like it's saying here, no, I'm telling this in such a way that people aren't going to understand and they're not going to turn and be forgiven. How do you know it's from Isaiah? Um, I have a Bible. We're down in the, the footnotes. It will link to other stuff and in some commentaries it, it refers back to that had I come better prepared tonight I would have come with that verse so we could read it in the context that it was in, in Isaiah but I ran out of time for that um, but I don't know how does that verse verse 12 strike anyone here Confusing. Why would he say that? Even the 12 uh, seemed no different from the crowd in this regard because they said, what in the world is this all about? Mm-hmm. And he says, to you has been given the secret. Well, I'm sure they don't quite feel that way. They're like, well, we must have missed that. But maybe he doesn't want you to falsely believe that you are now forgiven and what you were learning is fantastic and then you walk out and forget it all. So he's saying, I don't want to have them be forgiven because then they'll come back if it's that easy and be forgiven again and again. And it's false. The cheap grace that Dietrich Bonhoeffer refers to, grace without genuine repentance, forgiveness without genuine repentance. You just keep coming over and over again and saying, oh, I'll just do this and God will forgive me. Yes, exactly. Um, Paul talks about that. Should I continue sinning so that grace may abound? If, if our sin leads to God's grace, why wouldn't we just sin more and more so we can get more and more grace? That's an interesting look at that, Gender. What does this, they may not turn again. What, what does turn again mean? Turn. Um, this, this comes from the Hebrew word Shuv, which means it's where we get the word to repent. To repent is literally to turn. You're you're oriented to one thing, and you turn back to God and reorient your life to God. So repenting. All through the, these first few chapters, Jesus has been going around, repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. Uh, but now he's saying, we're telling these in parables so that people will not repent. Is it in quotes, Patrick, because he, this is one of those examples where Jesus is fulfilling what's been said in the Old Testament? So it's in quotes just because it's from Isaiah, but fulfilling what Isaiah said, I don't know. Because this is so hard to understand. And I mean, I looked at, at multiple commentaries today, and not a lot of them could make sense out of this. <laughs> This is just a hard saying of Jesus. That maybe something has been lost to time that that we're just missing. Um, But it it seems to be, he seems to be drawing a line between insiders and outsiders, which totally conflicts with what we've been hearing for the past two weeks, where the outsiders were always in, and Jesus is going to these people who weren't typically accepted. So he explains the parable in this next section, and and we've walked through some of that already. He just breaks down this means this and this means that. Um, Anything surprise you in there before we move along to the next part of this? We've already kind of walked through some of it, so I didn't know if there were still any questions about it. 
All right, well, the other side of the page then. Jesus shifts. So away from the, the parable of the sower, and he starts talking about a lamp and a bushel basket. You know, do you, do you hide a lamp under a basket? Do you put a lamp under your bed? No, you put it on a lampstand. There are different versions of this in other Gospels. In Matthew's Gospel, this is a part of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, no one takes a lamp and puts it under a bushel basket or under a bed. You put it on a table so it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so others can see your good works and give glory to God. That's how Matthew has it, but that's not how Mark has it. It's not about us showing our light. It's about us being enlightened. So he says, a lamp is, is brought in and put on the lampstand, for there is nothing hidden except to be disclosed, nor is anything secret except to come to light. Not about us sharing our light, but it's about being illuminated. Um, so one way that, that a lot of scholars have, have come to understand this, and, and even this hard part on the other side, is to say that it is not by our own wisdom and striving and knowledge and learning that we will, that the word of God will take root and grow in us. It's a gift given to us by God. We do nothing, it is revealed to us. And to be good soil means to you know, put yourself in the best possible situation to receive it when it is revealed. Uh, so. I don't know if that helps any to think of there are some people inside and outside and those on the outside God is choosing not to reveal it to them. I mean that has implications. That doesn't seem as inclusive as the other stuff that we've heard Jesus saying and doing so far. And then it gets even more so in these next verses where he says pay attention to what you hear. The measure you give will be the measure you get and still more will be given you. For to those who have, more will be given, and from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. That also does not seem like something Jesus would say. This is a part of a different parable elsewhere in the Gospels. Uh, but here, for whatever reason, Mark has it situated here. Um, you would think you know, to those who have nothing, the poor, more will be given to them. And to those who have, and you know, those who have a lot or too much, it'll be taken away from them. So he's talking about something a little different, though. It, it, I've seen this explained as um, those who are the good soil and are opening themselves up and are really trying to get this and do this. It, it comes by grace, but those who are really trying it and, and striving for it, uh, to them, more will be given. But for those who have nothing to show for it, you know, it's not bearing any fruit in their lives. Even what they have will be taken away. Um, basically, Jesus saying, you need to receive this and do something with it. You need to have something to show for it. And if you don't, it's going to be taken away. Where this is included in Matthew's gospel is in the parable of the talents, where it talks about this wealthy landowner gave one servant this much money, another this much, and another this much. And this one went out and made you know, three times more money, and, and this one went out and made more money. But this one, he was scared. He didn't want to lose it and risk it, so he just kind of hid it away and gave him back what he was given. And the landowner gets really mad. And says, um, you know, you, you knew that I was harsh. Why wouldn't you at least go invest it and make some interest? And it ends with, you know, for those who have, more will be given. So to those who have something to show for the gifts they've been given, more will be given to them. For those who do nothing with it, even what they have will be taken away. Yeah, but they might not know how to, how to make more of it. <clears throat> Patrick, can you read the first paragraph on the second page, like in conjunction with the parables, that first part we were talking about on the first page? 
I mean, yeah, they're they're all continuing in. So what are you seeing about that? Then? So like the part about the lampstand. So like he's talking about the parables on the first page and saying like you don't understand. Mm -hmm. and the part from Isaiah about they may need love but they not receive, they may not listen. And then if you read that first paragraph where it says, for there is nothing hidden except to be disclosed, nor is anything secret except to come to light, the idea is that the message of God is hidden in the parable, mm -hmm. but it's hidden and it will be meant to be disclosed later on, like you were saying, that it comes through God, not the person. So this is a very good point that I actually saw in several commentaries about this. What Jesus is talking about is not the final situation people will find themselves in. It's not disclosed to you. It's never going to be disclosed. They're saying it's like penultimate, that in the end, everything will be disclosed. But for a little while, there are just going to be people who don't get it. Uh, so in the end, yes. Um, yeah, you can absolutely read it that way. Because it is just one continuous section. Um, so, but the, the gist of that first one on this page being receive the word of God and do something with it and have something to show for it. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're making that effort, that's what God wants to see. You know, we, we may not know what to do with it, how to make more of it, we, but if we're, if we're trying, it's that um, prayer from Thomas Merton, the, I, I believe the fact that I want to please God pleases God. So it's just not sitting on it, not taking it for granted like Ginger was talking about, but doing something with it. So we move on to the next section, and again, someone scattering seed. But this time he starts with the kingdom of God is as if someone scattering seed. So he's, he's moved to talking about the kingdom of God. Someone scatters seed, they go to sleep, and when they wake up, the seed has grown, and they don't know how. I mean, I can't tell you how a plant grows. I know there are science books I could go read that would explain all that, but um, I don't know. It, it is grown. The earth produces of itself. I don't do anything to make it happen. God does something to make it happen. And so, you know, how does the word of God grow in us? God does something to make it happen. We don't know. Uh, the kingdom of God can be understood as the whole realm of God's rule and reign and power and authority, where God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. So if you think of the kingdom of God as God's will being done, when we do God's will, we're living in the kingdom of God. Uh, it's saying that, you know, that is as if this, and it is something that God does in us. So again, it's not by our own striving. See, there's like two conflicting messages here. You need to have something to show for it. You need to try. You need, But it's not by your own striving and trying. It's God doing this in you. Very confusing sections. And it almost makes you feel like you're the ones that he talks about on the first page that you're looking and not perceiving and listening but not hearing. It's not very encouraging in that respect. So he talks again about the kingdom of God, like a mustard seed. It's the smallest of all the seeds on the earth, which all these commentaries are quick to point out it's not. There are smaller seeds. I was wondering. Yeah, it's not. I've got mustard seeds in my office. I should have brought them over. See, they're, you know, they're big enough you can roll it around. Um, yet when it's sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs. Well, it doesn't become the biggest of all shrubs. It, it's small, and then it grows into something big, and that's kind of the point here. The, the kingdom of God, God's will, can start off really, really tiny, and God can grow it into something really big in you. And we don't know how that works, but you, know, you, you would think of comparing the kingdom of God to a towering cedar tree. That's what the Old Testament refers to all the time. It's just a huge cedar, but Jesus says, no, it's a tiny little mustard seed that grows into a shrub, but, he says, it puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. That is a loaded statement. There's a lot going on there. The birds of the air. If we flip back over to the other side in verse, um, 
let's see, it starts in verse 3, or 4, I'm sorry. As he sowed, some fell on a path, and the birds came and ate it up. And then when he explains it later in 15, he says, these are the ones on the path where the word is sown. When they hear it, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word. So the birds eat it up. And he's comparing Satan to the birds. Birds of the air is used in the Old Testament to refer to Gentile nations. Uh, Ezekiel 31, verse 6, it, it uses birds of the air to talk about all those who are not Jewish, the Gentiles. Birds of the air, uh, if you go back and read the, the Levitical codes in the Old Testament, they're unclean. You don't eat birds of the air. Uh, when, when Peter sees the, the sheet coming down from heaven in the book of Acts, and it's filled with all these unclean things, it, it has birds of the air. Uh, so... What do you mean birds of the air? Like pheasants or something? Or? Like hawks, birds of prey, almost. Um, you know, you, you drive by on the side of the road and see like a, a vulture or something eating some roadkill, and it's just, it's gross. And, and it's, those are ugly birds, they're nasty. That's what we're supposed to think of here. Um, not a dove, you know, the bird of peace that the Holy Spirit comes in. But what this is saying is the kingdom of God starts small, can grow really big, and give shade to those who are unclean and those who are outside of the people of Israel. So now we're back again to this is for the outsiders. We're just back and forth in this. Uh, it's you know inside and outside, but now this is for the outsiders again. And then we get into this last section. With many such parables he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it, didn't speak except in parables, explained everything to them in private. We don't get all of those, but we're told that he does. So then we get away from teaching and come back into kind of a narrative that evening has come and Jesus says, let's go over to the other side of the lake. The other side of the lake is non-Jewish territory. The other side of the Sea of Galilee, or the Lake of Gennesaret, it's kind of the, the two names for the same thing. Um, so we're going over into non-Jewish territory. And as they're going, this big windstorm arises, and the waves are beating in, and Jesus is asleep. There's a lot of parallels here with the Jonah story. Uh, when Jonah was on the ship, he was down asleep when the storm popped up, and then he you know, threw himself overboard, and the... The big fish swallowed him up. Um, so Jesus is in the stern, asleep, and they wake him up. They're freaking out. Don't you care? We're going to die. Jesus stands up and rebukes the wind and says, Peace, be still, which is the same words that were used back in chapter 1 when Jesus tells a demon or an unclean spirit to be silent. So in, in the first chapter, Jesus is saying, stop talking. He's casting out this unclean spirit, and here he's like exercising the storm, telling it to stop. And the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. And he says to the disciples, have you still no faith? You still don't believe? You still don't trust? You know, you think you're going to die when I'm right here with you? And they end this chapter with saying, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? They still don't understand who he is. And remember, this is a theme that we see all throughout Mark's gospel. They don't get it. And Jesus is then telling people, don't say it. Tell the people who do get it, he says, don't say anything about it. Uh, this is referred to by scholars as the messianic secret. Jesus does something, and people are in awe of this, and he says, don't tell anyone. The, the evil spirits recognize him as the Son of God, the Holy One of God. He says, you're not allowed to talk about this. Be silent. We talked about this before. You would think you want to get the word out more and more, so more and more people would come and follow him, but that's not what he wants here. And there is a reason for this. That, and it's like... Um, a narrative reason that Mark is using. 
All throughout the gospel, we're going to see this more and more. Jesus is saying, don't tell anyone who I am. You know, people don't need to know who I am until the very end in chapter 15 when Jesus is being crucified and he breathes his last and he dies and the Roman guard standing at the foot of the cross says, truly, this man was God's son. And so the idea being that Jesus is not fully revealed as the Son of God. His glory is not fully made known until he is on the cross. And that's what all of this is building up to. And that's when we look and see, this is who Jesus is when he's being crucified. Not just the healings, not just the the miracles or the teachings, but that. Um... There is one more thing going on here with the storm. All throughout Jewish theology, water is associated with chaos. In Genesis, in the very beginning, it doesn't say that there was nothing in existence. It says there was a formless void of shifting waters. It was just like a blob of of water that had no form, and it was just swirling around, and it talks about the uh, God starts bringing order to it, and there was the the waters were just chaotic. And and so Jewish theology has this understanding of water and chaos, but that God brings order to the chaos. In creation, God pushes back the, the waters and makes a limit for it, and then there's dry land. The Psalms talk about this too, about how God marks a line and says, you shall not pass this, and the waters do not pass it, and they stay there. So God brings order to the chaos, and here... You know, there's chaos, they think they're going to die, and Jesus brings order to that chaos. And they say, who then is this? Well, you know, the obvious answer would be it's God who brings order to the chaos. Is but all they... this in Israel, Patrick? So right now, they are crossing the Sea of Galilee. But yes, all of this to this point has been in Israel. And now they're just getting ready to go over to that other side. So, took way more time than I wanted to on chapter 5. That's my fault. Um, Or chapter 4. Chapter 5, let's get into that because then we're going to see him coming over to the other side. Uh, So, again, we'll just go verse by verse. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when he he had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man out of... A man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs, and no one could restrain him any more, even with a chain. For he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart, and the shackles he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him. And he shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion. Many were, we are many. He begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there on the hillside a great herd of swine was feeding. And the unclean spirits begged him, Send us into the swine, let us enter them. So he gave them permission. The unclean spirits came out and entered the swine. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. The swine herds ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there clothed and in his right mind the very man who had had the legion, and they were afraid. 
Those who had seen what had happened to the demoniac and to the swine reported it. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave the neighborhood. Ginger, you want to? Sorry. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, <clears throat> Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd, crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet. And begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. And she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? You looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While, while he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. <coughs> when he came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they, say, and they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him. And he went to, in, to where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Okay, anything surprise you about Jesus in this chapter? Anything jump out at you or, or confuse you? Or? Yeah, he's constantly, <coughs> constantly doing something that attracts a crowd, astonishes them, gets them wondering, some of them believing, and then tells them not to tell anybody. <laughs> Others, anything that surprised you, jump out at you? When he asked who touched me, I assumed he would have been touched. You felt the power go out from him. Whatever that means, we're, we're not told exactly. He just feels something has changed, but has no idea who did it. Anything else? Well, he has a miraculous, maybe just a thought, and it can heal somebody. If I just touch his clothes. I'll be made well. Mm 
those farmers that had the pigs, they lost 2,000 pigs. Yes. Which is considerable. Yeah, that's how they make their living. Yeah. Right? So 2,000 pigs, gone. Right. And, and some scholars will say the reason that they were afraid, one, is because Jesus has just done this amazing thing. And who are you with this kind of power that can do? We don't want you here among us. But also, he's just cost these people their livelihood. What's he going to do to the rest of us? Get out of here. We don't want you here. Yeah, so there's the, those two things going on. It's surprising. Um, we talked about how he keeps saying, don't tell anyone. But he tells the demoniac, tell everyone what the Lord has done for you. And he's completely different. Tell everyone what the Lord has done for you. And it says he went away and told them how much Jesus had done for him. And I don't think that's accidental. You know, it's making that a... There are people who are getting it. Uh, but yeah, he says, go and tell. And it's the first time we've heard that. So the thing I've always liked about this first story... Jesus is, is over on this other side here. Um, the name of the place we think he was is Gergesa, the country of the Gerasenes. There's a little town right across there called Gergesa. Um, and goes through this whole thing with this man possessed by an unclean spirit who's howling and, and beating himself and just sounds horrible. Just a tormented life. This insane, can't even live among people, has to go out and live in a cemetery somewhere, and they chain him up just to try to keep him under control. And Jesus starts interacting again with the unclean spirits, and he asks him, what is your name? And the spirit says, my name is Legion, for we are many. Where else have you heard the word Legion? Units of soldiers in Rome is referred to as a legion. Now, it's not for sure that this is what it's talking about, but one understanding or interpretation of this um, is that Mark's gospel, we talked about this the first week, thought to have been written between 64 and 70 AD. In 66 AD, there was a revolt in Judea, southern, southern Israel. So Jesus is up here. There was a revolt down here around Jerusalem. And a Roman legion called Legio ex Fratensis, 10th Legion of the Strait, uh, was dispatched to put it down. And one of the emblems of this legion was a boar or a pig. So there's some thought that they're making a play here on Rome, which was occupying and ruling Israel at the time and oppressing them, uh, saying this is an evil spirit. Uh, but... Jesus is going to cast it out and send it into pigs, and they're just going to rush down and, and drown. So a little bit of political play here with the uh, Romans who they weren't, a, weren't fans of. Uh, but again, 2,000 pigs, they're, they're thinking that's kind of like the 30 and 60 and 100 fold, that it's just an insanely big, outrageous number. 2,000 pigs rushing down a hillside and drowning in the sea. Um, it's supposed to be just implausible, uh, just, you know, again, stressing the, the awe of what Jesus is able to do. And so then, like Brian said, you know, the, the, the people taking care of the pigs, they run off and tell everybody about it. People come to see what's happened, and they see this guy sitting there who they all know is crazy, and they've had to chain him up, and he's just cool and calm, sitting right with Jesus. And they see what happened to him and to the pigs, and they begin to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. They're sending Jesus away for whatever reason. They're, they're in awe. They're afraid of losing more. They just send him away. Um, and that's where we get the part. We you know, go tell your friends how much the Lord has done. He tells them how much Jesus has done. Then Jesus crosses back over to the other side. So right now we're getting back and forth over here, just keeps going across the sea. And he crosses, and then again there's a crowd. And one of the leaders of the synagogue comes to him. So up through these first, you know, three chapters especially, we didn't see it so much in the last chapter, 
Jesus has been at odds with the leader of the synagogue. They're already trying to find ways to kill him and stop him. Uh, but this leader of the synagogue comes to him and begs him repeatedly, my daughter is dying. Come and just put your hands on her and she'll be made well and live. So now even the leaders of the synagogue are seeing something about Jesus that they recognize is of God, that, that this is an amazing person who can do amazing things. So Jesus goes with him, big crowd following them, and a woman who has been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years comes up. In the Old Testament, under Jewish law, a woman who was hemorrhaging, any discharge of blood, that woman was considered unclean. Okay, so here is a woman who is unclean, should not be coming into contact with anyone under Jewish law, and she comes up and touches Jesus. Big no-no. That did not happen, because now Jesus would be considered unclean. Uh, and so he feels the power go out from him. Who touched me? And they have no idea. And, and the woman comes and admits it. Um, and so there's some thought that maybe the who touched me is just coaxing her to, to come out and admit it and acknowledge that, yeah, I'm the one who did that. Um, he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Not I have made you well. Your faith. You trusted so much, and that's what has made you well. Go in peace and be healed. Now, I, want to, I do want to jump right away to this next section, because we get this, he's going, he gets interrupted, and then it picks back up. So he's going to Jairus' house, when the people come out and say, she's dead, don't bother Jesus anymore, there's no point. And so Jesus, you know, don't fear, just believe, trust. And he takes Peter and James and John with him, and they go in, and all these people wailing and, and weeping. And there's, there was a, a tradition in ancient Israel. Sometimes you would hire mourners to come and make a big commotion that showed how loved this person was. So we don't know if, it, if, these, if these were hired mourners who were paid to weep and wail, because uh, they seem to laugh pretty quickly. Uh, once Jesus says, she's not dead, she's sleeping, and they laugh at him. Or it could just be people who are honestly grieving and distressed at this. So he takes them in with him and goes to the little girl who has died. They, Jesus says she's not sleeping, she's not dead but sleeping, but they've said, you know, she's, she's dead. And Jesus takes her by the hand. He touches a dead body. Again, unclean. By Jewish law, you are not supposed to come into contact with a dead body. You're not supposed to touch it. And he touches and says, get up. We don't know why the original language, the Aramaic, is preserved there. There are some places in the Gospels where it keeps that original language. Uh, and not sure why. Um, but the girl gets up. She was 12 years of age. How long had the woman been suffering from hemorrhages? 12 years. Anytime you see 12, in scripture. Mm -hmm. That's like a, a big blaring number that you were supposed to think of the people of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. 12 is almost always a stand-in for that. You're, it is supposed to take you right back to the 12 tribes of Israel, the people of Israel as a whole. So, you know, what could be implied in that, that, that the people of Israel have been suffering for a long time and Jesus has come to heal them, that the people of Israel were unclean and, and Jesus has come to heal them. Um, there's no consensus on that. The people of Israel are, are dead or just asleep and Jesus has come to raise them up. No consensus on exactly what the 12 is, but it's a clear connection between these two stories and with the people of Israel. And then again, orders that no one should know this and tells them to give her something to eat. That's a strange detail to end with. <laughs> give her something to eat. There's another place in the gospel after Jesus is, is risen 
uh, not in Mark's gospel, but uh, he's, he's risen from the dead. It's in John's gospel. And it says he takes a piece of boiled fish and eats it in their presence. Why? Because ghosts don't eat food. And so you're saying that Jesus is actually physically alive. He's not just a ghost appearing to them. Well, here, you know, the girl is actually alive. She eats something. She's not just a ghost, I guess. Um, but again, no consensus behind what that actually means. So we're just after eight, and I, I want to try to look at this as a whole right now. Because what we're trying to do here is see Jesus as he is. And so the question is, what can these two chapters tell us about who Jesus is? What Jesus is like? Barbara? So, all right, what I'm about to say, the woman who's hemorrhaging doesn't fit into it because he never told her not to tell anyone. Okay. So that doesn't fit. But otherwise, it looked it seems when he went over to the Gentile side, he told the demon, tell people about it. When he's on the Jewish side, he's saying, don't tell anyone about it. Hmm. But I don't know about this hemorrhaging woman part. Yeah. But it struck me that um, if Jesus were going to be with us on earth forever, it would be fine that everyone knew that he was the son of God. But because he was leaving us, if everyone believed him immediately because everyone knew he was the son of God, the next generation, the word of mouth would eventually go away that people wouldn't believe anymore. So he needed to train up the disciples to spread the word. So he, on the Jewish side, told everybody not to say, and the sowing of seeds is training them. He's telling them the secret of the kingdom mm -hmm. and explaining the parables so that they can then, when he's gone, sow the seed and build the church. And on if, the Gentile side, they might need more help to be told immediately because the Jewish side might not want to tell the Gentile side. And, and the Gentiles don't have that whole history that the Jewish people have. There, there's not a, a history or, or a hope of the Messiah. If you look at the story of the woman with hemorrhages and the little girl as one story, because it's he's going, he's interrupted, and he's go, it, it kind of is a sandwich story there, then that still could fit because it says at the very end, he says that no one should know, and it could be implied for the woman with hemorrhages, too. Um, hmm. And he's frequently in conflict with the leaders of the synagogues and the Pharisees and stuff, and then this particular person happens to be a respected person at the synagogue, and he doesn't just ask Jesus, he th throws himself at his feet. That's pretty... Uh, you know, you've taken all your ego right out That's of the equation. That's humbling. Yeah. That's embarrassing, almost. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Does this tell you anything else about who Jesus is? What Jesus is about here? These are two very different chapters. Because in chapter 4, we get the whole inside-outside thing. And the outsiders don't get it, the insiders do. And in chapter 5, if you're looking at the people of Israel and Gentiles as insiders and outsiders, the Gentiles are getting it, and the people of Israel, except for Jairus, they aren't. So they, they seem to be conflicting messages there. Were they fighting with each other? Who? The Gentiles and the other people? We don't have that here. I mean, the Romans were Gentiles, and the Romans were obviously like an occupying presence and oppressing the people of Israel. So in that sense, Jews had always been instructed, don't have anything to do with Gentiles. They are unclean. Don't associate with them. So they're at least at odds, or not whole. It's amazing to me that this, that he only did these things for three years, right? Mm -hmm. And he had to go up back and forth in Israel on foot, no Ubers or anything like that. Yeah, just a boat, maybe? Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. amazing. 
And, and kind of to what Barbara was saying, um, telling them, don't tell anyone, you tell someone. It, and with this understanding that it's not until the very end when he's on the cross that this is God's son, that, that it's mm -hmm. fully revealed. It's almost like saying, it's not the healings and the miracles who show you who I am. It's not the teachings who show you who I am. It is this sacrificial death that, that shows us who Jesus really is. And perhaps if people had known, okay, this is the Messiah, this is the Son of God, they would have tried or fought harder to keep him from being crucified. And you know, that's where his glory is, is fully revealed. So maybe don't tell anyone right now because we need to see this. And this is what he ultimately came to do. That's one way of understanding it, I don't know. So Jesus is teaching in parables. He's performing miracles and healing. He's violating all kinds of Jewish laws. Some places seems to be identifying with the outsiders. Some places outsiders seem to be pushed out. Anything else it's showing us here? Patrick, I'm just going back to uh, taking your point about so Jesus maybe working through this over, over three years and it finally mm -hmm. results in the crucifixion. Back in uh, chapter 4, starting with uh, verse 26, the kingdom of God is, is, is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and sleep grass. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. Think of that as Jesus for just a second. But when the grain is ripe, at once it goes in, the kingdom of God comes in with the sickle because the harvest has come. It's kind of like you got to wait for it to grow and then you have the harvest because it's finally the grain. And, and if we can also see it as Jesus scattering the seed and, and growing these you know, followers, believers, yeah, it takes time to grow that. And if people know he's the Messiah, uh, either he's, he's going to be crucified right away by the Jewish religious leaders because that's blasphemy and you don't go around saying that. Um, or, uh, or I don't know, um, they might prevent him from, from doing that. But. Tom, are you saying the crucifixion is the harvest? Well, that's, that's the that point I was trying to get. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it is probably it's interesting. Stretch, but, uh. <laughs> no, I, I, it's a parable, remember? So yeah. multiple interpretations that it's just causing us to dig into it, to think about every possible aspect of it. Parables just want you to think about God. That's all they want you to do. You think about this, that, 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 just you're thinking about God. It's just drawing you into it. As you were describing in, from 38 through 40, and you described water is associated with chaos mm -hmm. throughout the Bible, but then God brings order to chaos, I immediately saw a modern day image all of this water that's across the south and that's the chaos mm -hmm. but God is bringing um, all sorts of people to clean up the ground to get the electricity flowing to get the internet going so God is bringing order to the chaos caused by the water and the waters didn't stay risen forever they were, eventually they receded, they were pushed back. Who is this then that even the wind and the sea obey him? So it's almost like we are walking with the people in these stories as we're reading along. 
because this all isn't entirely clear to us. What does Jesus mean by this? It's like we're, we're right there with them. We don't get all of this. You know, wow, this is an amazing person. We're just as much in awe of, of this as they were. So we're kind of tracking along with the story as if we were in it. And, and it's the one thing that stands out above everything else here about Jesus is that it, it's kind of like that last statement, who then is this? It's that, whoa, like something significant is going on here. Something that if I just touch him, I'm going to be made well. Something that I'm, I can go and beg for him to heal my daughter because I believe that he can do that. Uh, there's just this awe around him right now. So we'll see where that takes us next week when we look at 6 and 7. And, and so then, like I mentioned over there, we'll meet next week, but not the week after. We'll have a mission project then uh, putting together the cleanup buckets for hurricane relief. So um, hope that you'll still join us for that. We, you know, we wanted to find a way to, to keep everyone engaged in a week that we didn't have class so that you know, it's not just no one shows up for dinner. And we thought this would be a really great way to do it. Because I think we all know people who are being affected by this storm. Um, if nothing else, Victor and Jane Wilson, former pastor, his wife down there, who are okay, by the way. Um, you talked to them? Uh, Betsy Miller talked to or heard something from their daughter. Yeah. yeah, but they're okay. All right, well, let's pray and then we'll go out. Lord, we have the benefit of 2,000 years of hindsight, and, and so we know who Jesus is. But we still don't always understand. And so we pray that your light would illuminate us, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, that you would make us good soil where your word could take root and grow that you would help us to trust so much that in our most desperate moments of need, we would turn to Jesus and not just to our own means and ability. That is what we see all through this, Lord, and, and that you are able to do amazing, impossible things. Help us to trust in that as we go out from here until we gather together again in Jesus' name. Thank you all.